So dwarves had come back to 40k, and I was super excited when I first found out about it. I knew as soon as I saw the first promo images that I had to own this army. The only thing was that as GW put out their uh, promotional materials or marketing materials for the army, I wasn't really impressed with the way the army scheme was presented. After reading up on the lore of the different different leagues and stuff in, in Botan, I knew that I wanted to do Greater Thurian League. And typically, I kind of gravitate more towards the poster boys. I have an Ultramarines army. I would consider High Fleet Behemoth more poster boy than High Fleet Leviathan, so I have that army as well. And my, uh, I, I guess, like, Space Wolves didn't have a poster boy type army to speak of, but I kind of went more with, like, Logan Grimnar's chapter as the little uh, insignia on the shoulder pad. But with Leagues of Votan, I found myself wanting to alter the paint scheme on the studio representation that they threw out there. So I uh, thought it would be fun to kind of do this video in the style of uh, one of my favorite cooking YouTubers, Joshua Weissman. He does all these videos where he goes to fast food restaurants and grabs something and then tries to make it at his place, but better. And that's what I'm attempting to do here. So by the end of this video, I'll ask if, uh, if you think that I have achieved the GW paint scheme, but better, uh, even though I'm altering the paint scheme just a little bit. I did want to make it clear that I don't think that the GW paint scheme is executed poorly, like the actual process of putting the paint on the model. I'm not poking fun at any of the painters who are working for GW or doing their uh, tutorials online for the Greater Thurian League. Really, I think GW has to boil down the complexity of their paint schemes for these initial releases to make sure that when people are looking at the game and wanting to get into it, they're not intimidated by the difficulty of the paint job. And especially when you're doing something like a massively white army, it's, it could be intimidating to someone who hasn't painted an army ever before, someone who's a little bit like, uh, I won't say lower on the curve, I would say that they are your standard painter where they're picking up those GW colors and throwing them on the model. I really don't mean to put this video in the light of insulting anyone or saying that people just need to innately be better at painting in order to be in this hobby. I'm only stating that myself, I prefer to hold myself to a different standard than what GW puts on their boxes, and that's what I'm trying to execute here. So hopefully anyone who is painting at that level could probably could hopefully learn something from the video. And if there's anything people want to know more about or they think I glazed over something a little too quickly, quickly in my video, uh, just post a comment in the section below there to let me know what you want to see more of. I always read my comments. I might not respond to all of them all the time, but I do make sure to check up on every single thing that people are saying or people were wanting to communicate to me. So uh, don't feel like I'm trashing anything and feel free to ask me any questions, or if you want to see some more elaboration on a technique, I'm more than happy to try and do something like that. So I'll start off priming the model with Pro Acryl's White. Uh, this is going to be done through an airbrush because I am mixing in uh, a little bit of the Lupercal Green that's going to kind of be the base for our armor in general. I wanted to mix the two, the, the, the white and the green together because I want to be able to get like a mid-tone to be able to work up my highlights and work my or work my highlights down or my low lights, whatever you want to call them. And that way I'm just having a, a, a mid-tone type color so I don't have to, f my highlights don't have to fight my base coat. So in order to do this, I'm taking a small little steel cup and mixing in some of Vallejo's uh, airbrush primer. It's not necessary. I usually use water, but I just had it more available. Pro Krill grows, goes in, and now I'm getting out this Lupercal Green. You can see that I don't use a lot of it. Uh, the thing about white in general is that it's much like the hearts of men. It's easily corrupted, so it doesn't take a whole lot of a color to kind of tint it. And one of the reasons why I'm mixing in something separate from my airbrush is uh, this is more so af affected by having a larger cup or painting a lot of stuff at once, but this way I get to make sure that my paint is thoroughly mixed because when you're mixing in that cup sometimes you can uh, get parts that aren't quite mixed up and you'll be shooting like two different colors or something like that. So just going around the whole model with that color you, you can see when it comes out it looks super duper bright. Part of that's my lighting. The other part of that is just the nature of 
white when you're mixing it with things. It just seems to look lighter. And I am painting a medic here because I got a little too excited and painted my uh, my Thane that was going to go in my Hearthkin unit uh, in order to get some you know prime models on the table for a test game after the codex got rebalanced. So uh, I had to show something. But this is what the model looks like when it's when it's dry completely. So you can see they're just a little bit darker. And then there's the Thane to show you that we're working with the same color here. So for the armor, we're only going to be using these two colors, the Lupercal Green and Vallejo Model Color White. We are going to use one a little bit later, but that's for, for later. Um, the I don't have any specific reason for grabbing Vallejo White uh, for this one. It's just what was readily available, and I guess I appreciate the consistency. Now, given that we're going to be trying to do this as a butt better style... I am going to use a wet palette because we're going to be using wet blending, glazing, and layering. And in order for those things to work well for you, uh, you don't want to have to keep rehydrating your paint and watching it change its consistency in a traditional like dry palette. So this is just a red red grass games XL palette. Uh, if you're making your own out of like a deli ham container and some blister foam, then that works just fine too. Uh, I just find that this is, you know, the size that I like and uh, it, it functions for me. One of the big things that helps you out when you're doing painting like this, you know, glazing, layering, and, uh, and blending is being able to have access to a spectrum of your blends and highlights or your colors that you're using for this. So this way I don't have to worry about doing this very rigid, like, two to one for white to green or something like that because I can sit here on this palette and lay out a spectrum of colors that I can pull from and then while I'm painting the mini I can just kind of go back and forth between the different types of colors that I've got laid out I can like increase my white if I need to or I can put in some more green if I need the the, the shadows to be a little bit darker it just works really well Taking a look at GW's promotional or marketing images for the Votan, most of it's all in Greater Thurian League. And specifically, let's hone in on the comms fellow and the scanner dude in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for cool interest or contrast to be built up on these armor panels. And then we also have that opportunity on the shoulders. There's just... Uh, a, there's plenty of potential for us to make some cool looking models here and GW's at least attempted to do it with some of them like on that scanner in the bottom right hand corner you can see there's some shadows in the corners of their armor panels towards the bottom but we're going to pump that up quite a bit just to try and make this look a little bit more interesting. So to start off, I wanted to mention my little mini holder here. This is an old vitamin bottle, and uh, I really like this with some blue tack under the model, uh, especially these child safety ones because you can spin the lid around to not have to move your hand when you're painting the model. It just really helps. So uh, I, if you're looking for some kind of holder, look towards vitamins or large prescription bottles or something like that, and, uh, and it'll set you right. You won't have to spend a ton of money on mini holders in order to paint your stuff. This also gives you a nice little area to brace yourself uh, so that you're kind of eliminating the opportunity for some of those shakes. I know a lot of the locals that I talk to say they've got problems with shakes when they paint uh, because they're just so focused on things. But then they tell me that they're not using, they're not bracing themselves on anything. So you're giving yourself a little bit more stability, almost like a kickstand for painting here. So that's... Uh, that's my soapbox for using mini holders. So I'm pretty sure you can tell that I'm, you can tell everything I'm doing at this angle. Uh, we're going to go ahead and change that. So I had started on one of the little tummy panels and uh, it wasn't going quite the way I wanted it to. So I decided to take a break from that and let it dry and then move over onto the shoulder pad. Uh, my blends are very unpredictable. So it's nice to be able to go back and try and re uh, or reattempt them. Uh, they just uh, they turn out one of two ways, it seems. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. So I'm starting off the shoulder pad with a line of the rightmost color mix that I've got. That's uh, mostly the, the looper call teal and then a little bit of the white. And then I take some of that middle color, lay a big patch of that down. And off screen, I've got a paper towel that's a bit saturated with water. This lets me clear the paint off of the brush without having to wash it in my water cup and risk putting a bunch of water on the model because I didn't get all of it out of the brush on a dry paper towel. 
So with that, I'm able to just wiggle the brush back and forth uh, between those, where those two different lines of paint meet and then f pull that the darker color down to try and get a smooth transition. It's almost like I'm using the shoulder pad as a palette to mix like I did with the wet palette itself. So now I'm going to go in with the bright white, the, the white and teal mix that's furthest to the right and drop a little bit of that on the shoulder pad here. And my mix on the model wasn't quite uh, wet enough to continue to work with. So while I was wiggling back and forth, I just went back in with the uh, with the mid mix of teal and, and, and white and then just laid a line of that down so I could mix and then feather it out a little bit. So when I take the, the brush and clear it off on that saturated paper towel, I'm going to the point of the, the paint that's closest to the shadow part that I laid down and then just kind of pulling the paint out, almost like I'm pretending that I'm wet blending, but I'm just trying to thin the paint out and push it further back towards the model. Off screen, I'm just doing some blow drying here so that I can uh, dry the model up quickly and show it to you. So right now, I think we've got a pretty decent smooth transition between the that mid-tone teal and the dark part, but I'm not quite happy with the brightness of the corner of the pad where I wanted that highlight to be. So I grabbed some of the mixing water that I had on my palette, and then I decided to do some glazing. And that uh, you could see on the right most color mix that I had kind of put a little bit of extra water in there to make that uh, more transparent. So I'm starting at where I want the transition of the light to be and pulling towards that highest point of reflection on the shoulder pad. And that allows it to kind of put a screen of the bright color on there. And now I'm zooming in even more so you can see that I've got a decent transition. So I don't want to abandon you by saying, here's the shoulder pad, now just do that 50 times. So I wanted to show uh, the transition of wet blending on a larger surface. So I'm using the top part of the chest here. Now this one is not catching a ton of light, so we're not going to pull the highlight up a lot. But we're laying down that darker teal white mix coming in with that mid-tone laying down two lines, clearing the brush on that damp cloth, and then we're just wiggling back and forth. Then you can see I'm kind of pulling the shadow forward or the darker color forward because uh, this side isn't going to be catching a lot of light. I'm kind of doing an upper right hand source of light here. So I want to pull my paint, the darker paint, forward so that I'm, my transition looks a little bit darker on that side. If it were the opposite and I wanted more light, I would do the lighter side into the darker side. So now I've come back with that, the whiter teal mix, the one on the far left of my palette. And that one, the paint still wasn't quite wet, so I hope that this shows a little bit better of that, or a little bit better example of that feathering technique that I was talking about, where the brush is still a little damp, but then you're just kind of pulling, almost glazing with the paint that you already have on your palette back, so that we can uh, get that transition without having to kind of restart the wet blend. So. Off, the, off to the side, I pulled in some more water from my wet palette to thin down that white. You can see it's a little ghosty on the palette there. And this is me just glazing. So the paint's real thin, and I just wanted to pull up a little bit more of a highlight. Didn't want to start the wet blend over again, so I've just decided to go through and glaze down a thin layer of white on the... Uh, right side of that chest just to give it a little bit more of a, a bounce of light. And then this is just me putting some dark green in to start some other transitions. To really push the highlights up, we're going to be going for Titanium White from Golden Acrylic So Flat line. This paint is packed with tons of pigment, so we're not going to get that tinting effect that we've been getting with our white otherwise. the So far, the that weird quality that this white has to it, or the white that we've been painting with, has been nice in order to get these nice smooth transitions, but now we really want to punch that white highlight, and this is the paint we're going to need to do it. Following the steps that I've done so far, here's the mini at that point. All the panels are highlighted with the, the teal and white mixture that we've got, so now it's time to start pulling out that so flat color and punching up the highlights. You can see on the palette that it's quite thin, but that doesn't mean that the pigmentation is so split that we can't get the colors to register. And now there you saw me use a technique that is, it's a little risky, but you can use your finger to kind of blend some things out if you feel like you've got too much on the palette. 
or too much on the model, sorry. So that's just what I did with the uh, with the shoulder pad there. I felt like I put too much white on, considering this is supposed to be a darker, uh, the darker part of the model. So I just kind of pulled that pigment back with my thumb a little bit. It's almost like you're smearing it. Uh, I wouldn't completely recommend doing that all the time, but if you can get the hang of it, it's a pretty nice little trick. It can give you some quick, smooth highlights without having to uh, spend a ton of time glazing or layering or anything like that. So I seem to do this a lot for whatever reason. I didn't realize I did that so much until now. But this shoulder is where the highlight's going to be a little bit more strong. So you can see I'm kind of employing that standard glazing method of starting at the point where I want the highlight to be the weakest and then drawing the brush out to get that highlight on. And after a bit here, I just, the, the, the white's dried up, so I've come back to kind of reestablish that highlight with, even though the titanium white is still super strong, uh, it is nice to just give that last crisp, strong highlight on there to put another layer down just to make sure you've got it registering as super bright white on the tips here. We want to make sure that the model is still kind of paying homage to the greater Thurian League that GW set up for us, but we want to make sure that there's a lot of interest in every single transition on the panels so making sure we end on that super bright white is going to be key to making sure this model pops a lot so one of the final things that i'm doing here just to lift the highlights up a little bit is going through and lining all of the recesses of the model with straight looper call green now this stuff is pretty thin down you can see through it on my palette there on the the middle right of the palette uh, and this is where, you know, I think some people like to say that, you know, any size brush will treat you just fine. It just depends on the tip. But I, this is where I'll disagree with that. I think you having small tip brushes makes stuff like this a lot more uh, simplistic to do. Uh, you're not loading your brush up with a ton of paint and worrying about hitting other parts of your model. This way I've got a nice long thin tip that's going to get into these little crevices so that I can put down a line of that looper call green and not worry about hitting something else or having a huge splotch of this stuff hit the rest of my model. Now we can move on to the cloth parts. We're going to be mixing in uh, looper call green to most of the steps to kind of start the cloth. This kind of pulls the model together. It keeps kind of the same tone between the cloth and the armor that we kind of see in the GW example. So we're taking the looper call green to start out with, and we're going to be mixing in Abaddon black to start off the base coat for this. And I, the reason why I'm not going straight black with this one is I want to try and pull the model together with some of its different uh, pieces. The, the thing about the GW paint scheme is that nothing really pops on that model. And I know that that doesn't make sense when I'm trying to do something better than they've got. But there's a very specific reason I'm doing this, and that's so when we do hit the things that are supposed to pop, that they just really get elevated to a whole nother level. So if I had to give like a percentage or a ratio for paints, I would probably say it's like one to one Abaddon black and looper call green. You mostly want to make sure that you're seeing some of the teal coming out there. And, uh, you know, this, this step is just really covering the model with this particular paint. There's nothing fancy here. You just want to be really careful to dodge those white armor panels that we had done. Uh, I know sometimes I like to start off with the color that's the deepest so that I don't have to worry about this kind of stuff. But since white is such a pain in the butt to paint sometimes, I did not want to have to you know, cover the model in this Abaddon black teal mix and then try and build white up from there. It's just not something fun. Uh, it's the white is just so much more difficult to paint so it's easier to do this so essentially there's nothing fancy about what I'm doing here putting paint on a model and we'll come back when it's all finished to start working on those highlights so it took me about two coats of that Abaddon black Lupercal green mix to get this nice and saturated but you can see we got them covered up pretty well so let's go ahead and grab the D the Dark Reaper from GW and start mixing that in with the previous mix that we had to cover this model. And the reason why I'm not just going with the straight uh, Dark Reaper is because I do want to, I'm going to just be layering the model for this part of it. I'm not going to be messing around with doing a bunch of uh, 
glazing or uh, wet blending. There might be a little bit of glazing, but mostly I'm going to do layering. I think with black, you can get away with doing layers because it's just so dark and you're you're only really trying to pop up some of the really reflective portions. So since we're not really transitioning, making a super hard transition to that Dark Reaper, our, tran our, our layers will read as transitions, I guess. It's not going to be, you know, the prettiest thing in the universe, but it's definitely going to be better than just a couple edged highlights slapped down. We'll move on to the final highlight for the, the cloth on the model. I think it's final-ish. And this is just going to be that uh, wolf gray or... Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Wolf Gray from Vallejo Game Color. And this one I'm getting a little sloppy with in terms of the mix. Uh, I'm wanting to try and make sure that it's not too much of a departure from that Dark Reaper Looper Call Abaddon Black mix. Since it's so bright, it can be really easy to have this get away from you. So I just want to put the smallest bit of that paint into that mix so that I can try and get that highlight to work better. So now that we're in a little bit better of a focus, we just want to spend our attention on the really important parts of this model, the ones that are going to be, we're trying to call a lot of attention to. <laughs> so with this, we're kind of gl glaring, I guess, or glazing. I don't know. It's it's like a layering plus glazing type thing I think I'm doing here. I, I don't, it's thin enough to where I think you could, can, you could read it as glazing, but it's also... A little bit more on the thick side so it kind of comes off as layering at any rate I, I think it's you know if you follow those types of strategies where you're putting thinning the paint down and then starting where you don't want the paint to be brightest and then pulling it to where you want it to be the lightest then you're pretty good when we get to these shoulder pads or knee pads or elbow pads, I guess elbow pads, no shoulder pads, but um, I'm keeping the paint a little thicker so I can control the line. Same thing with the fingers here. I just want like really sharp highlights on these. For the leather, I'm using a mix of uh, Thondia Brown from Games Workshop and then Green Stuff World has this leather brown that I'm trying out here as a, a mix for the highlight. So I'm setting up this Thondia Brown on my wet palette and while I'm at it, I'm getting the mix with the Green Stuff World Leather Brown going. And I think this paint on its own looks really decent. Like when you put those two colors together, they look like they would function really well. But when I mix them together, you can see that we're kind of getting a green tint. And I know that I wanted to keep the colors in this model like similar-ish so that when we put some of those contrasting colors on, they really do pop. But I don't think I'm really appreciating the greenish tint that the leather's getting here because the leather was in originally going to be one of the colors that I was hoping would bring a little bit more visual interest to the model, like make it stand out a little bit more. Uh, but I'm not so certain that I'm digging what's going on with that color right now. So this is essentially just taking all the parts that I would register as leather, like the belt, the, the weapon pouches, the... The, the boots and the little uh, handle on the pa on that plasma axe and just covering them like you would normally. Nothing fancy here. So here's the model after all of the leather parts have been covered. And now we're going to move on to the first highlight. This is very similar to what I did with the pants. I've just mixed the uh, Thondia Brown and Green Stuff World Leather Brown together. And then I'm putting some layers on here. I wouldn't I wouldn't quite call it glazing again. I think it's more layering, but just with thinner paint. Maybe I am glazing. It's it's just a weird... I don't really like all the terms for different styles of painting. It's just I kind of do what feels right and put it on the model. Like, wet blending is wet blending, but, um, you know, these the line between glazing and layering, I feel like, is a little bit more thin than people would like to, uh, would, would like to admit. So uh, just follow the same steps here of going through and highlighting that model uh, just to call out those, uh, those brown mid-tones. So here's where we start to see my complaints about how this Green Stuff World Leather Brown is looking with that Thondia Brown mix. It's just standing out too much. We've got that greenish brown leather that's existing on the rest of the model, and the Green Stuff World Leather is more so what I kind of wanted the whole thing to be, was more of this orangey leather brown. So I'm laying down the highlights because I'm kind of just here, so I might as well do it. But in the future, I'd probably mix this down with a different type of brown. 
In order to fix this for the moment, I've decided to take some Agrax Earthshade, and this is old GW Agrax Earthshade, not their new stuff that's more thin, and uh, started throwing it on the model. The reason why I call it specifically the old style wash for GW is that this stuff is a little bit more pigmented, so it's almost more acting like a, 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 a screen of brown. It kind of uh, it's almost like uh, when they say shade, it really is a shade. It's not a wash. So uh, I'm just trying to bring the highlight down to kind of be a little bit more cohesive brown. Like I said, in the future, I'm probably not going to be using this leather brown from Green Stuff World on the rest of the model. I'm probably going to switch to something like Beastie Brown or something from Vallejo Game Color. I'm going to jump around a little bit to things that maybe people might not have seen all over the place so like I'm skipping the metals on the gun like the silvers I'm skipping the power weapon because there's a million and one videos out there to watch on how to paint power weapons if you feel like you want to see my process on either of those two especially with this army in mind uh, post a comment on the video and uh, that'll let me know that I need to go ahead and make one but I just didn't want this to drag out so long with showing everyone things they've already seen before but with this step, we're going to be utilizing some pure metal pigments from Green Stuff World to try and get these golds to really bounce a lot against that green. So I've already f base coated the entirety of the parts on the model that I wanted to read as bronze with that decayed metal from Scale 7.5. Uh, it was probably a little too dark for what I needed to do here. I probably could have mixed it with this stuff. But in order to get that uh, metallic pigment from Green Stuff World to work, I'm mixing in some of their Master Medium, which I've always, I have plenty of dry pigments hanging around, but I've never been able to find a really great medium to mix into them so that they behave the way that I want them to. But this Master Medium from Green Stuff World not only works really well with the uh, metallic pigments that they've got, but I also have like Hera's like fluorescent pigments hanging around, and it does really well with those too. So I'm switching brushes here because I grabbed the wrong one. I instead was using the brush that I mashed all the pigmentation together with instead of the one that I wanted to paint with. So I start off with one of these little side plugs, and I'm just applying the pigments uh, pretty thin on the, on the top portion, and then grabbing a little bit of that decayed metal, laying a line down, and blending them together. These uh, pure metal pigments seem to blend pretty well, so don't be afraid to kind of mix them up with your other paints. I'd be interested to try some more with this to try and like mix them into that decayed metal to try and help bring it up a little bit because it is super dark. So we're just going to keep zapping the model with this bronze and uh, then move on to the next one. So now I'm kicking over to the gold. They have an antique gold, but this is just the plain, plain ass gold, regular gold. Um, this one I wanted to try and make a little thicker because my highlights here are going to be a little bit more pointed. So I put just a tad bit more metal pigment in and a little less of the master medium in just to try and thicken this up a little. Uh, I believe I might add just a tad bit of water to this, but not a whole lot because I did want to keep it pretty, uh, pretty thick. Yeah, so I was pretty pretty uh, sparing with the water that I added to this one. So after we load the brush up, I'm just going to be hitting some of the very top details, and this gold stands out enough against the bronze. You can see I accidentally went into the cup that I had used previously on another model. That was fun. But uh, yeah, I'm just hitting the top edges here. I'm not getting too crazy with blending or feathering out any of this because it's close enough to the bronze to where you don't really need to spend a whole lot of time trying to shift smoothly between the two. If you're trying to paint this for a competition, then sure, maybe you're going to be a little bit more diligent with how you blend these together or how you get that transition to work. But for me, I've got 60 of these guys to paint, and I'm not going to get too crazy with having to blend the highlights together. You can see even on the sides here, I'm just using the brush to do an edge highlight along those uh, uh, along the patterns that are carved in the, the crest. I'm not getting uh, too intense with trying to go ahead and highlight those with the tip of the brush. This paint flows well enough to be able to do that, but it's just not something that I'm wanting to do right now considering the time that I've spent on this miniature. So just to remind us, here's what GW's image looks like for how they expect the Greater Thurian League to be painted, and then here's a spin down of what I ended up with. So I feel like we achieved what we set out to do to make Greater Thurian League look just a little bit more dynamic than what GW has. Of course mine registers a little bit more like greenish, like minty green, instead of their kind of drab military looking 
white, green, gray thing they got going on. But I do think that a full unit of these is going to look really appealing on the table, going to bring a lot of interest to that tabletop and show that the dwarves can hit the table with some style. Uh, I know as time goes on and I keep working on these models, I will only get better with the blends and smoothing things out. And I really think that you can take the the techniques that I've used on this model and apply them to any other paint scheme and you'll be able to end up with something that's a little bit more attractive looking than what GW has put out for us. So I think I achieved what I was seeking out to do with this video. I got a paint scheme for the Greater Thurian League that I like a lot more than what GW has presented for us and as I clip through the rest of the army I should get better at painting that scheme or quicker at least. I know when I first started it took me about a week to finish one model, and now I'm down to like maybe five or six hours for one model. So it's it's not perfect, but it should be getting better at least as I go on. If you have made it to the end of the video, I really do appreciate it. And uh, if you have any like suggestions or questions or anything that you'd like me to elaborate on, just post it in the comments below, and I will make sure to read that and respond, or maybe it might spur on another video. Uh, I'm interested to see if people really like this uh, this approach to this but better type series. Uh, I'm interested to see where that goes at least. So uh, thanks again for watching, and I look forward to seeing you all here in the next video.